So I think uh, to begin with, uh, it, it is probably a bit easier. This is a road which has been well traveled, at least this segment, the mechanical alignment part of it. We all have gone through this road at some point at the beginning, initiated, and then we find, found a way to divert to see if things can get better in the alternate pathways. So kinematic alignment versus mechanical alignment, which way to go? I think let me share some of my thoughts about this mechanical alignment. Like Ridian mentioned, I don't really want to make it a true debate. There is no winners, losers. It is to see the goodness of both the sides and whether we can probably plug both together and get optimal and good sort of outcomes in the surgeries we do. So maybe it is the discussion which we have to generate ourselves on the basis of choice, why we do what we do, limit the limits of the indication for those techniques, what's the benefit and why, and the biology and the science behind it. One thing very important for the just about initiated and the early surgeons is that you need to be familiar and the procedure and the processes should be feasible and have a very sound understanding, both anatomic and the scientific, and at least one provision backup and all weather option which you should always have should in case the newer options not give you the optimized situation and need to get out of troubled waters and that is going to be a mechanical element at all times which is something which we have traveled all the time this was a picture i just borrowed from one of the uh, systematic reviews which were done in two years ago if you have a constitution alignment of this sort i think there are various ways to build the cat we have sort of uh, the factors we need to consider at all levels at the hip, distal femur, proximal tibia, at the foot and ankle, which sort of impact the way we perform and the way the outcomes come up. So suppose if the one that conventionally what we have been doing is the anatomic and the mechanical axis on that side or the anatomic axis, which probably induce certain changes into the secondary changes, especially the soft tissue envelope around the knee joint. And, but then this is something which has been performed in the highest numbers. If you do not want, the second concept is look at it like a unique content or replacement should only the one compartment be involved. This is something totally resurfacing. You're not touching the soft tissues. You don't change anything at the hip or the ankle or anything else in the area and you get a fairly good outcome. A kinematic alignment, Simon, which who, who is going to be addressing this, uh, is again an extension of just a resurfacing of the joint as it actually looks. And so we get this, we retain everything else and see how the outcome is and what the outcomes are. And there has some middle road which has also been discussed and debated and also presented and published. Basically the restricted mechanical alignment and the adjusted anatomic alignment. These are concepts which are evolving, which have been evolved to overcome probably the difficult situations. But one thing that always comes to my mind when I think of subjects like this is, uh, if you look at it very philosophically, as has been mentioned, by one of the Iranian Persian scholars, to design for human use would aim to put the product to the user, but because man is a finished product, so the design has to adapt to the man. So in that regard, if you put a mechanical and anatomic axis and the kinematic axis, the mechanical axis tries to fit the processes to the bone, whereas kinematic tends to adapt to it. So I think it's reasonable to say there is a logic on both the sides. It was not new, David, Ford, if you see the early anatomic uh, model and the concepts, uh, it was a little valgus alignment which he had propagated with a little varus tibia. It was based on some anatomic studies and the findings. Uh, but the biggest concern why it did not catch the light of the day in those times was because of, of the concern of reproducibility. What if suppose the 87 becomes 85 or 83 and what will be the catastrophic outcome? That was one big concern, not in the hands of the experts, but in an average surgeon. But now today, I think that question is overcome because we have precision tools, we have navigation, the robot assisted devices, which are going to help us to place exactly where we want and where we plan. And also we have other option, you can still cut under the mechanical axis and then use devices and implants that have the built-in borders or the angles which are available, though probably that may be a question of inventory. But what I mean to say is there are options possible should you go, go in this direction. But to overcome this concern which Hungerford proposed was the reason why the classical mechanical alignment came in. And the a group of Freeman, Insel, Ranavath, others brought in the concept of perpendicular cuts, equalized flexion extension gaps. This made the procedure much easier, more predictable outcomes, easier to perform, and the instrumentation and devices were optimized to get these sort of And that was one reason which it got popular. But one downside was that in, when we do this, we were changing the whole the mechanics, the main change in the anatomy, and that always 
physicists were compelled to do some element of soft tissue release. But one thing about the mechanical assets, which you all have been using right from the time of the uh, in the 80s, is that this sort of adapts to every geometry. It is uh, possible and it is adaptable to all morphologies, all shapes. So that is the biggest take home in this. Mechanical axis is a buyout for all situations. But if you look at the overall publications and the data which have been published, a innumerable number of articles have been published also with regard to other variables. In the 80s, the focus was on implications on survival, whether what alignment it works, whether the virus, the vulgus, or the neutral. And this was published by the Mayo series. 10 years down the line, I think we were still talking only about the alignment and what alignment is good in terms of the prosthetic long-term survival. And Ritter's publication again alluded to this. But there was no more discussion. Though there was a sort of a peripheral discussion, the predominant focus was loosening joint failures. Till another decade later, this John Insel Award paper from Phil Noble talked about the functional satisfaction of the patients with the joint. And it was seen that it was highly variable. I mean, we all know about this. Satisfied, very really satisfied is around 75 to 80%, and a fair number, almost 20%, touching 15 to 20%, not being that satisfied. And the reasons were many, residual stiffness, swelling, expectations about the outcome, and the early intervention in the joints. And if you look at the ADL activities of daily living being restored, only about 50% were done post-operative. And if you age match it to the people of the same age without a surgery, almost 22% alone. So, I mean, there was a big gap between what we expect, what we anticipate, what we propose, and what we really have in it. And so functional outcome, this again was subsequently alluded to by the Toronto group by Bob Boone, and they again reported about a 20% loss. So, there is some joints to this. If you talk, this was one of the treatises that was talked about, discussed, why the pain and the symptoms continue to persist following a total knee when we have bleed surface, the entire painful articular surface. It is basically because we need to look at the joint homeostasis and there is a finite zone in the normal physiological loading and activities. You may take bicycling or swimming, jumping from a decent height, two to three meters. When you do this, there's a fair amount of absorption that happens and it knee becomes painful when you go into, when you, we go into the supranormal areas. And this joint, throughout this area of joint loading, that should not be any pain. And if there's any swelling or synovitis, that indicates some problem. If there's a poor range, again, an issue. And also, they studied with the scintigraphic evidence to see any hot spots in the peri periarticular bones, which again suggests bone activity, which can induce be a cause. And what we see post knee is that knee does not seem to eliminate the nociceptive sources completely. There still is a gap. There's a scope for improvement. And probably two things which was uh, talked about and what we think is important is the reduced tissue trauma surgery and mimicking the normal kinematics. Probably this probably was something that was missing in the way we performed the knee at that time, basically the mechanical alignment. And of course, appropriate spatial component positioning that's important. So in short, if you look at it, in terms of mechanical alignment, there is a downside, none of them is absolutely perfect. It's a biomechanically implant friendly, and friendly alignment. But beyond that, there is no bearing of the mechanical element or animatics. In fact, in, uh, it uh, induces some changes uh, and it's not a true patient specific in that kinematic sense. So since it induces alterations to the tissue envelope, impacts the changes to the isometry of the ligament attachments. And probably these were the reasons why we get that element of uh, dissatisfaction in this. So if you look at the current positives for a mechanical axis, I think if you look at all the implant designs have been designed towards a mechanical alignment. This comes into importance if you talk of the patellofemoral alignment, which is less talked about. When we talk of mechanical or climatic, we are restricting to a great extent on the coronal alignment alone. But if you look at the sagittal axis and the rotational positions, probably this may have had an impact, will have an impact when you shift the concepts, potentially, I mean. And even loading of the poly is assured if you've got the mechanical axis correct. But if you put the kinematic concept in, and if it is beyond the permissible margins, whether that will have an impact on the wear issues of the poly because of the eccentric loading is a question that needs to be discussed. On top of it, the mechanical axis is an all weather friend and a technique useful for all indications, easily applicable to in all hands. It's a good starting point for the just initiated surgeons. And over the two decades, I think the manual instrumentation has been fine tuned for ease and people are finding it, people have enough access to all this. 
But the question that comes is, is uh, which has come in the last decade is a neutral mechanical axis, a sacrosanct situation. I think it doesn't appear so as we see in the subsequent uh, slides. Uh, the alignment can vary and we have to realize that in functionally and practically, the human alignment of the joint varies in terms of how we position the leg, how we load the joint, how the patient stature, the patient geography from wherever he comes and other, other morphological changes. So the caveat is if, even if you have err on either the wireless or the valgus side, so long as you maintain the joint parallelism, I think it serves a great deal. It balances up the joint and probably you are assured of a fair degree of function. And of course, you need to have the stability and the balanced space. This was probably uh, an explosive paper which really brought this out into light. In a long-term review from Dan Belly and the Mayo Group, what they realized was mechanical aligned joints, when they compared to the uh, alignments beyond the permissible limits, the results were the same. Which means even if you align within the three degrees, you did not have any great improvement. The mean to say that alignment alone is of not a great value. We need to look at the other variables also too. And this is practically, we have also seen ourselves just here serendipity. This is a lady of mine so many about uh, 15 years ago. We did a uni on one side, a total on the other side. It's a virus tibial placement. It was not planned, but the function was spectacular and she's still going strong. So it clearly shows that what's very clear, complex relationship exists between the prosthetic alignment and the soft tissue tensions. And irrespective of what technique we adopt, we need to pay attention to this. Another of these now done with the mechanical legs. This is a virus, a stiff virus. If you look at the X-ray, it looks like a valgus knee placement, but it has been positioned. We have corrected the angles, it will overcorrect it. But functionally, if you see, they do extremely well. And this degree of deformity could be done without much soft tissue release, except for a minimal reduction osteotomy on the proximal tibia. None of the soft tissues were touched. So by playing between the bone sections and the soft tissues, you are still able to use the same mechanical principles, but with additional use of the tools that is available to you. So with this, when we have access to additional technology, I think we can also talk about what is called as the adjusted mechanical alignment. That we don't have to get a 90 degree distal femur, 90 degree distal tibia, and then totally parallel a neutral joint line. We can probably play around to minimize the tissue dis dissections Basically, the goal needs to be, if need be, and if necessary, to balance. You may undercorrect the frontal deformity, virus or the valgus, but do not exceed a limit of three to four degrees. I think that is a number we have to keep in mind. Maintain, because, and then as a starting point, most surgeons in this group who have been trying out these changes, they fine tune the tibial alignment. They get the femur as anatomic position where it should be, and preferably keep the mechanical cut of the tibia and stay only within this range so that we maintain the coronal plane alignment and also the joint line. I again reiterate that you have to stay within the tissue envelope and titrate the balancing both with a bit of a bone with a bit of a soft tissue. So these technologies, whether it is navigation or the robot assisted devices, they help in minimizing and enabling final balance and execution. And this is independent of the alignment concept which we use. It works on the function, the longevity and the client satisfaction. So to come back to the point, kinematic alignment versus the mechanical alignment, which way to go? I think alignment in TKA, the classic mechanical alignment, I would probably submit that is time tested. The way you do it is stood the test of time. We have data that crosses 20, 25 years. We have functionally, which is there. There is a weak link in terms of the overall functional satisfaction. I do concede, but otherwise broadly across the spectrum, across the various surgical groups, the degree of experience, the degree of anatomy, the degree of morphological geometry, geometrical changes. I think this is one system which works for all. Mechanical alignment, there are no true contraindications. You now also know that we have got the data to prove that we can deviate a bit to the left and a bit to the right without being very detrimental to the overall long-term survival and the overall average function. There are these changes that happen in the capsular ligamentous area, basically you know, in extreme cases with osteophytes, erosion, sagittal pathologies, extraortical deformities. All these are well altered, uh, the change, but they can well be accommodated with the mechanical alignment. So in improving the functional outcomes and the patient satisfaction score, which is a big point in mechanical alignment, uh, I think uh, what I would probably, my approach would be in my mid, mild to moderate deformities, I still try to avoid any degree of soft tissue release, 
compens compensate the bone cuts to remain some extent with the use of of course the technology free hand may be a little bit of a challenge titrated balancing between and stay within the boundaries probably you are much better off your results progressively tend to improve and in very severe pathologies it is the mechanical alignment and i would not like to deviate at this point in time and most of these need to be a case based adjustments we don't have a cookbook to this do not correct beyond the permissible safe boundaries and look at the other causes when i mean what i mean to say is sometimes all the deformities that we see again are probably because of huge osteophytic changes posteriorly or some capsular contractures and in this cases when you use these instrumented devices and the uh, guided technologies you sometimes tend to look at the numbers but we need to factor this when we play with it because when you take off the posterior osteophytes automatically it corrects so probably you may not need that degree which the machine is trying to tell you to do Co uh, now a couple of points a valgus deformity again no soft tissue little bit minimal correction this was a partially corrected case and if you look at the post op i think it is doing well just a few points before uh, dr simon goes into the detail on the kinematic alignment and issues my own personal issues and concerns have been addressing the coronal what these are the issues how do we address the coronal alignment we all talk all the time only about the coronal valgus varus and the uh, joint line obliquity and inclination but there are the sagittal plane issues how do we overcome this appropriately because it's a three dimensional correction after all how do we quantify appropriately and correctly the articular erosions when you want to balance when you want to take take out exactly and reproduce the femoral anatomy wear concerns on the poly when the wear and the, uh, the deformity correction in, uh, imposes more than a 6 to 7 degree varus cut or a varus alignment would there be concerns for the poly wear is we do not know and the impact of acl pcl deficiencies in all these cases do they really become kinematic in that sense in vitro we have some data that if you have extreme varus beyond 6 to 7 the nakamura studies say that there is an increase in the stresses both on the medial and the lateral side so i think it's a point that needs to be taken and in terms of the uh, i think steven offel has pub published that he has a 1797 survivorship even with a range of 8.5 degree deviation and a 7 degree varus but this is in the hand of an expert who exactly knows the stuff so whether it is reproducible is a question concern and limitations of course do exist for the kinematic the patellofemoral issues what do we do in case of the severe valgus i think these are the questions probably to be left for the debate and find a great learning curve i think in terms of judgment and ex execution which is needed like all techniques i would say so some takeaways based on the current evidence i think this kinematic concept i like to adopt into the mechanical technique which i do mild to moderate deformities i would still add deformities needing more than 5 degree inclination i will trade with caution and I will not go use of weights has improved in adapting and blending both these together and the manual technique purely reserved to of kinematic alignment probably is only for the experience and uh, the biggest benefit is the rtts we achieve and this is one last um, slide which i just alluded to which says that kinematic concept though intuitively extremely attractive i think it is probably way to go in certain situations there are a lot of hiccups in this one need to be very careful be aware of it and maybe start with the simpler cases before you go into this so in conclusion mechanical alignment is time tested familiar all indications acceptable refined instrumentation today is available there is advanced technology to probably go for the adjusted designs and the techniques even load distribution takes up the concern of eccentric load and the eccentric lift offs and the long term outcomes we know and that is probably the biggest uh, uh, sort of go to when we talk about mechanical alignment thank you for your attention